Dave and Helen Edwards are co-founders of Artificiality, a think tank dedicated to unraveling AI's impact on individuals, organizations, and society through research, publications, and events. The couple previously co-founded Intelligentsia.ai and sold it to Atlantic Media. Dave previously worked at Apple, CRV, Macromedia, Morgan Stanley, and Quartz. Helen previously worked at Meridian Energy, Pacific Gas and Electric, Quartz, and TransPower. So it's really my uh, distinct pleasure to have the opportunity to have Dave and Helen Edwards on Ed on the Edge. So Dave is um, somebody I've long admired. He, he and I are former colleagues from a firm that I started called Think Equity, which is a research-oriented investment bank. And one of the things I always appreciated about David is that um, he was really, really good at connecting the dots. And, and so he's been, uh, in his career, he had the opportunity to work with Mary Meeker at the beginning of kind of the internet heyday. And then when I think equity was uh, really the first person to kind of identify sustainability as a theme and then move to green technology. And now with his wife, Helen, they've got a very cool firm up in Bend, Oregon called Artificiality. And most recently had the opportunity to do a project with us doing some deep dive research into how AI is going to impact learning and what you call the intimacy economy. So again, welcome to Ed on the Edge. So talk about this project and what you learned. Talk about what you did, who you interviewed, and what you learned from it. Thank you for having us. It's been, it's great. And uh, we're loving being here at the event with you. Um, it's a wonderful uh, event. Um, so it was a great um, uh, project, really. I mean, we've identified the intimacy economy for us as the sort of next stage of the attention economy. We spent 20 years with the attention being the currency of what we do online. We pay attention, we get things, we offer up our content to, and to be paid attention to, and it's that sort of transaction. As we move into this newer world of AI with new generative AI and conversational AI, we're starting to share things with these tools, share things with these systems, communicate with them in ways that they're starting to capture information about us that's quite intimate, our needs, our wants, our desires. These are things that you could infer maybe through a search or a click or what you watched before, but now we're explicitly stating them in order to get really good information back, right? And in order for AI to really work for you, it has to understand the context of you to be able to sort of infer what the intent might be of what you're looking for. So that intimacy is what we think will become much more of the currency of, of the future. And what's interesting is when you think about that as intimacy and a knowledge of your intimate self and think about applying that to learning, you start to think, well, of course, that makes a lot of sense, right? To know... To be able to teach someone, or you have to know where they are. You have to meet them where they are in their journey. When you're learning, you have to figure out where you are in the journey and think about where you might want to go with it. Where do I want to path? What path do I want? What subject do I want to take in in college? What 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 part of my journey am I on as a, as an adult? You know that I'm still learning. That requires some level of self understanding, some metacognition, some understanding of what really matters to you. So this journey was great. It was a great project where we got to thank you so much for introducing us to some wonderful people that we got to interview and talk to them about their ideas about education and learning, the products that they're working on, the systems that they're working within, and be able to kind of stitch all that together. Yeah, I want to add something. I mean, you hear the word intimacy economy as coming from the attention economy, right? You've got to have a healthy degree of skepticism about, yeah. about that because yeah. it doesn't – I mean, if the attention economy was out, about data mining – and inference and the right to reasonable inferences, which we never got, the intimacy economy is going to be about life mining, essentially. And the, the, the healthy skepticism is who owns that, who gets to decide. It's very much that sort of extension of, of thinking about what's the diff when does it become surveillance. Now, we think the intimacy economy is a given, but we want to demand that it comes for us, that it is for us. It's not actually just an extension of... Uh, cohort-based inferences, data mining that works for big tech. So the intimacy economy is where it has to go for us to regain our attention and to regain our presence in the real world. 
I mean, part of the intimacy economy should be able, where we are able to disconnect in a way, then unplug in a way, and we can just present with the people, regain some of those attentional skills. And that's quite subtle. It's actually quite counterintuitive. You think the intimacy economy is going to be about being focused on what the machine is giving you and being intimate with the machine. It's only part of the story. The bigger story is how it gives us back our intimacy skills with humans, with other people. But it's there's a lot you have to believe and there's a lot we have to demand because otherwise it'll just be like a, an extension of the, uh, the the bad things of the attention economy. And uh, the attention economy eroded its own resource. We have no attention anymore. We don't want the intimacy economy to erode that very resource. That would be a catastrophe. I should have made this into in the introduction. And, you know, with, with Dave and Helen Edwards, you might have guessed, are they brother and sister? But now with Helen reveal her voice, D Dave, Dave grew up in New Jersey and Helen grew up in Texas. No, she's <laughs> New, New Zealand. And so before I'm going to ask you more kind of some of the, 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 the learnings that you found, talk about how you two work together and how that all Develop. That's an interesting question. How we work together um, and why we work together is kind of inter inter intertwined, I guess, in that I think when we first started working together, one of the things that was attractive was we have um, very different minds and come at ideas from a very different perspective. And it's in the connection that those two that makes such a great partnership. You know, so um, in, in our current work, Helen really comes at all of our ideas and theories from a science perspective. So she's doing constantly doing meta research. We were sitting in the hall chatting with someone and I looked over and I said, I'm pretty sure that Helen's reading some sort of paper right now, research paper. And she takes all of these you know, vast number of ideas and finds links among them in ways that no one else will find and then passes it to me. And I'm coming at it from the world of more thinking about the world of um, the philosophy of what it means to be human, more from a design perspective. And I try to take all those unlinked things and make a story out of them. I totally concur with that. He, uh, he can pull the story out of me as well. So, but I want to go back also to this learning in the intimacy economy, because one of the reasons you do research is because you like learning yourself, right? And I learned something really important, really cemented for me in this learning in the intimacy economy, which is this huge question mark about social learning and friction and actually having to struggle. You know, there's fantastic scholarship around what it means to struggle and how it, you, you know, it, everything from Paul Bloom writing a book about, you know, the sweet spot where we choose, we choose a bit of pain, we choose a bit of struggle. And Peter Sterling, the neuroscientist, talks about the role of dopamine and is is almost often is as much often the relief from the struggle, right? And the 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 desire to master something, the desire to really know it and be able to go to that adjacent possible, as Sean Coffin would say, to make something new, to make new knowledge, and to make that your own. And I really learned that um, to be skeptical of AI claims about whether an AI can push a learner through that moment. It's just, it's a hard moment. It's very much social pressure and social cohesion and that, that need for human connection that takes you through that. You want to be able to prove to a mentor or to a peer that you can do it, that you're able to take this step and struggle and take it to that next level and learn. And I'm skeptical about whether machines can do that for us right now, but I am hopeful that this idea of this intimacy surface where you're able to be more dynamic about the way you interact with machines, I'm hopeful that we can get to that, but I'm certainly not someone who thinks that we should take the human out of the equation. I want to see instructors, I want to see tools designed really for instructors, less for parents and students, but more for instructors because that's what proves to us that we're keeping those humans properly in the loop. The excellent report you did. What are some key things that you think people will learn that were kind of big ideas to you? One of them is definitely the intimacy surface. So one of the things that we've been working on is this, this idea of what does it mean to actually create something in the intimacy economy? And we've used the idea of an intimacy surface. And we, st we, we sort of, it's sort of a riff on an idea that we worked on for years called the serendipity surface. Where can you find a surface in your life where there's possible serendipity? Right? And so the idea here is to how, to how do you create products or systems, cultures within organizations where there is an opportunity for some level of intimacy, right? some level of intimate connection. It's not required, but it has the ability for someone to engage with it because it's there as availability. And when you think about that for learning, then that you have to think about what does it mean to create a surface where people can be intimate with a machine, with some other collective, to be able to then learn, you know, have the invitation that the people can join in. I think we're so used to things having to be required, having to make sure that somebody has to do a thing because of that. And what we're thinking about is what does it mean to be to opt into that idea? 
Um, I do think that it's also important to, to sort of give some shout out to some of the people we did interview and talk with. And it's been exciting to um, uh, spend more time in the last couple of days with Mark Knopfel, right? And and in many ways, it, it was fun when we talked with him because he said, well, I wasn't quite sure what you guys were going to think. And, you know, am I a little bit of the enemy? And we said, no, 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 no. Actually, what you're trying to do fits very much in where we're th where we think intimacy could go in a in a positive way. You know, as he thinks about his journey of lifelong learning and really getting to know an individual through the system, an individual can choose that path. You know, what, where he's going with this is, and where his objectives are, are clearly beyond what is possible technically today, but where he's going it to us is really in line with what we think of the positive outcome of all of this. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Totally agree. How big an idea do you want? <laughs> Biggest. Okay, so... As I was going through, as we were going through this process, we've been involved in learning for a long time and um, in, in various roles, volunteer roles as well as professionally, and even though we're not formal educators, right? So, but one of the things that really, like, like I was trying to understand more in, in this process was the difference between, uh, and how would we understand complementary versus um, competitive cognition with machines, right? So what is a complementary um, artifact that helps us as ChatGPT allow us to, or any of these educational tools allow us to sort of grow our thinking so it's fully complementary. You take the machine away, it's left you with a trace, it's left you with something in, in your memory you can act on versus something that's competitive where you take it away and you can't do it anymore. So um, GPS versus maps is a classic. So you use a paper map or even a, just any sort of map that gives you that spatial cognition. It, you take that map away, you can still navigate. GPS doesn't work the same, so it's that. that. So as we got into this idea of complementary versus competitive, we're starting to think about the role of just pure information. And uh, coincidentally, because you know, I follow all the science and I'm just a junkie for anything to do with physics and biology and chemistry, that I uh, started to realize that we're actually talking about some really, really big ideas here when we're talking about AI either being complementary or, or, um, or competitive in a way that's really different from previous technologies. And what you do, if you trace this, you know, long story short, down this rabbit hole, you get to the end of it and you realize that what we're talking about now is a fundamental shift in science, that information and computation is this base level of everything. It's from atoms to algorithms, all made up of this core idea of information being fundamental. When you get to that point, you realize that information computation agency, that's a nice little step through, that that is, exists at a foundational level as well. And we're seeing this in the science. We're seeing scientists finding that um, as us as a bag of cells, how do you decide where the individual is? What's the collective? You know, is it is our phone part of us now? How do how do our cells know to be part of us? What does our biome help us think? You know, all of those things they coalesce around this information structure, and that information structure exists in software, exists in AI, and it's less that we see intelligence sort of becoming more sophisticated. It's actually that sophistication is at the base level. So when you get to that point, you suddenly have this aha moment that AI could become artificial life, could become artificial consciousness, could become these really big ideas, and we call that the artificiality. And so that's our conceit, right, to put a name on it. Kind of hope it sticks, probably won't. But you never know, right? <laughs> Someone coined the hard problem of consciousness and got famous. So we're, but we're, we're thinking really big about what it really means to connect with these machines so that the synthetic and the organic emerging and this process of tackling this through learning happenstance that that turned out to be kind of the the core nub because machine learning human learning you know we want to we want to invest yeah. in both yeah. where can people read this great report you can find it at dash media, dash media. <laughs> Uh, yes, they can find it at Dash Media. They can read all the rest of our things at artificiality.world. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to collaborating with you on other things too. Fabulous. Um, love what you do. Love working with you. And we've got uh, many fun uh, opportunities ahead. So thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.